make sure to say happy birthday. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah, it's Kirk's birthday. Right. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is uh, Clinton White of STG. And uh, he's going to be talking about project logistics. So many of the projects that Clinton and STG work on at a different scale than what we've just seen. Um, Clinton's the manager of uh, business development at STG and uh, has lived several places in Alaska, including Nome. And uh, you've been at STG since about 2008. And anyway, why don't we get started and look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Brent. Um, as Brent mentioned, I did start STG in 2008, and uh, I initially learned about STG through the company's work with renewable energy systems. Um, and their experience as one of the leading installers of community wind here in Alaska. That experience has uh, largely been gained through collaboration and our work for Brent and his team at ABEC. So it's kind of a fun opportunity just talking about what we've learned together over the years implementing these projects. Um, but the subject of this presentation is about logistics. Um, I wish our president, James St. George, was here to speak to you about this, but I'm going to do the best I can in his absence. Um, and I wanted to start just telling you a little bit about uh, our company and the work that we're involved with. We're primarily a heavy industry contractor and uh, more specifically, we build energy infrastructure projects. Uh, bulk fuel tank farms, uh, the project on the top left is a facility we constructed in Ruby in 2008. Uh, we build communication systems. Uh, the picture in the middle is a tower we constructed in Eek. Uh, this tower is part of uh, the Delta Net system. That's a microwave broadband network of about 40 towers that we constructed between 2004 and 2008 across Southwest Alaska. Um, interesting to this presentation, um, it's, it's projects like this actually that support our logistics act, uh, activities. Uh, in particular, this system has is, is greatly expanded communication abilities in the region and uh, more specifically uh, cell phone usage. Um, prior to this project, we're communicating by landlines, fax machines, but now we have the ability to speak directly to guys on the field at our job sites, which is a huge improvement in efficiencies for us. Uh, we also drive quite a few piles. Um, the project on the right is a uh, elevated boardwalk we built in Tuntatuliak. I think we finished that in 2008. Uh, but that project consisted of about a million pounds of treated timbers for the decking on that, and another million pounds of uh, pipe pile to support that structure. It's about a mile long connecting the uh, airport and the village in that community. Um, the photo on the bottom is, is a picture of a project we built in Unofleet. We finished that work in 2009. That was a six month project for us. We put in six wind turbines and about a mile and a half of uh, transmission line connecting that project to existing infrastructure. But we operate throughout the, the year here in Alaska. We have projects going on in the summer months. Uh, we have projects in the winter months as well and uh, completing projects across the state since we started about two decades ago up in Kotzebue. We're headquartered in Anchorage. We have regional staging yards in both Bethel and Nome, which uh, supports our real work. Uh, we're running the company out of Anchorage primarily. This is where our, all of our project managers are staged along with our logistics managers. Um, but the folks that are in Bethel and Nome are uh, a huge help to us in getting the job done and getting it done efficiently uh, when we head out to these rural settings. Um, in regards to working throughout the season, there's, uh, it might be important to note there's some work actually that can be only, only can be completed in the summer months. There's some work that only can be completed in the winter months. Uh, a lot of our work takes place in southwest Alaska. Uh, most of the communities out there have a very, very low or non-existent water table, which means you're de dealing with uh, basically swamp-like conditions. Very tough to move heavy equipment around in these communities uh, and to build projects that we're involved with. So in those locations, we might be barging in freight uh, in the summer months when it's successful, when the rivers are open. That'll sit for some period of time. Uh, the community will freeze over. We move equipment around to where it needs to be to do the work that uh, we're asked to complete. Uh, but over this 20 year time frame, we've completed projects uh, all the way as far north as Barrow, out in uh, remote communities in St. Lawrence Island, Savunga, Gamble, and the Pribilogs and the Aleutians, and um, lots of places in between. 
For us, logistics uh, really is probably not much different from any other construction firm, um, but it's the management materials and supplies, key components in regards to wind projects, that's just the, the cells, towers, blades, associated equipment, uh, and also personnel. Um, that can be quite challenging as well. Our crews generally work 10-hour um, shifts, seven days a week when they're on these job sites. Um, we do need to make sure that we rotate them in and out periodically, both for their own um, mental health and uh, for pro productivity reasons. But uh, in completing our logistics work, we're primarily using barge transportation, though once a project's underway, we're probably using air transportation more frequently. And, and really, all of this work is requires a pretty detailed understanding of the project requirements, what local conditions are like within a community or a job site, uh, as well as a very detailed understanding of carrier schedules, um, who's going to be where and when, and what sort of capacities they have, along with suppliers as well. Um, we need to understand who can produce what and under what time frame in order to make the schedules of uh, the barge carriers or whomever we're, we're using to uh, deliver these logistics services. And SDG as a company, we, we're not a logistics service provider. However, we work with all the companies that are and offer this as a, um, an area of, uh, that falls under project management with uh, jobs we're involved with. And we work with lots of different firms in this area. On the barge side of things, uh, Northland Services and Alaska Logistics are two of our biggest partners. We work closely with Linden Transport. Uh, they operate both barge and air services and a whole host of airlines. Uh, most of rural Alaska operates through the hub hubs uh, and Dillingham and Bethel and Nome and Kotzebue. So even with these barge services, you're, you're working through these hubs to some extent, uh, and certainly you are with the airlines, um, bringing in larger cargo to the hubs and then working with smaller uh, firms and aircraft, getting them out to individual remote job sites. And it's kind of interesting too, when you look at the logistics services that we provide with projects, they uh, change throughout you know, the completion or execution of a project rather. At, at the start of any work, um, logistics really is an exercise between our clients, project managers, and our logistic managers along with our suppliers to make sure that everything's well organized, that we can get as much as possible onto one particular sailing uh, and out to the job site as uh, quickly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, as some rough numbers for consideration, uh, logistics costs on any project might average between 10%, upwards to 50%, depending on the scope of the job and its location. Um, we look at logistics costs largely as a fixed cost element to our projects. Uh, you're going to need the heavy equipment to get the job done. And uh, in that respect, and, and in regards to wind projects, uh, it almost always pencils out to be a more cost-effective project when you can put in as much wind as possible when you distribute the uh, fixed costs of getting a crane and other associated equipment off the site. Uh, moving into the construction phase of work, logistic challenges shift a little bit. The emphasis comes more on making sure we're able to effectively mobilize equipment within a village locale and service the, the crews that are out on site. Uh, at STG, we, we certainly look at our field crews as, as our greatest assets and the source of the value that we're able to deliver for our clients, and we do all that we can to take care of them. Um, that really involves making sure they have what they need and they have it when they need it. Um, in addition to that, too, we do our best to make sure they're always well supplied with food, gr uh, groceries, and basic incidentals so um, uh, their living situation is well cared for so they can focus on the uh, difficult task of completing the work that's assigned to them. Moving some of this equipment around local settings is uh, not really a simple task either. Uh, you can see that middle, middle photo. That's out in Savunga. And I, I believe that was prior to a work uh, constructing a wind farm. I think that was during construction of a tank farm, but the photo you're looking at actually is, is uh, uh, one of our cranes walking down uh, one of the roadways in Savunga. And you can see that the boom's almost touching the ground and that's a necessary requirement to get under low hanging power lines and other obstacles. Uh, so getting that piece of equipment uh, onto the beach wasn't very simple by itself and it's certainly not gonna be much easier getting it just half a mile down the road to where it needs to go to work. During uh, you know, the completion of projects, we're constantly monitoring equipment, uh, trying to take note of any maintenance needs that may come up. So once a job is complete, um, 
there's potential that we might be sending that spread to multiple different locations. Um, it may be going back to a regional staging yard in Bethel and Nome to have maintenance uh, activities performed or be painted or more significant overhauls that can be completed in the field. Or uh, we might just be preparing for the next season coming up and we have to split that spread uh, depending on what work is coming up for us. In regards to uh, the barge, uh, network that we utilize, generally speaking, you're going to have uh, major sailings coming out of the Seattle-Tacoma area. Um, I'll use Northland as an example here, since uh, that's the photo you're looking at, one of their boats docked here in Anchorage. But Northland starts to service the Alaska market uh, in May and ends in September. So their first boat is coming out of Seattle the beginning of May. It'll arrive in western Alaska sometimes towards the end of May. They'll send up 10 sailings a year. Um, and the frequency of those sailings is pretty heavy on the front end of the season, May and June, maybe a weekly sailing uh, into August and wrapping up in September, it's more frequent and then usually once a month come in the middle of the summer. Uh, but these are uh, very massive vessels and this picture really doesn't do it justice to show how much cargo is loaded on these ships. But they'll initially come in to Anchorage, they'll dock, they'll either get added to or some supplies will be removed and then they'll start making their trip out west, uh, generally going out around the corner in Dutch Harbor and coming back and hitting some of the uh, regional hubs along the way, starting in Dillingham, uh, Bethel, Nome, moving up to Kotzebue. At the photo on the screen, actually, in some instances, these boats really never even hit the hubs. The, the photo you're looking at there is, um, that was taken outside of Uno Fleet, and uh, it's one of our cranes actually lightering materials from one of these uh, larger boats onto a smaller boat that's going to ultimately land on the beach in Unifleet. So, you know, we look at all these barge car carriers as our partners in getting this work done, but in many respects, we're um, a great partner to them. Uh, we're transporting heavy equipment on their boats, and it's going to work for them in some instances. Uh, this project is a great example. We're lightering off not just our equipment and supplies, but also equipment and supplies of other contractors who are working in the community. So uh, just through our experience and relationship with them over the years, uh, we, we've developed some really strong partnerships with all the logistic partners that we work with. From this point, it gets loaded on smaller vessels and ultimately it's going to hit the beach or, or some landing in one of the smaller villages somewhere in the state. Uh, and you can see from that bottom photo, these landings um, aren't terribly well developed. Uh, they're pretty cramped. So it can be some tight working quarters and a little bit of a challenge uh, moving cranes in particular in and out of this space. In regards to wind projects, um, uh, the weights really aren't something that causes too much an issue. However, the dimensions of the material sometimes can be rather tricky. Um, the three photos, uh, or the two on the top and the one on the left are uniplate photos, but the one on the bottom right is, is one that I kind of wanted to highlight. Uh, we call this particular uh, piece a wagon wheel. Basically, it's a a prefabricated steel structure that we use to support some of the wind turbines that we're installing. Um, this is a design that was developed uh, largely uh, through AVEC, um, but this design also usually sits on pile foundations. This uh, particular piece of uh, the project is quite heavy. It's a 66,000 pound piece of steel, um, or at least the design we're using now is. Um, so as you might imagine, that's going to add some cost to your logistic expense. If you look at project cost how holistically though, um, by having stuff prefabricated and able to use these networks, you're actually building that foundation for a much cheaper cost in another market. You're gonna pay more in your logistics cost to get it there, but at the end of the day, your foundation solution costs you less money. So we always look for ways to, to find prefabricated materials, to look at ways we can package things more efficiently, um, to look at overall project costs. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, logistics costs are, are certainly a significant element to a project, but um, there are ways to do things uh, fairly efficiently. I wanted to show these two images just to provide a, uh, a perspective on kind of what we're dealing with with local conditions. The larger photo is Kasigluk, uh, and if you look at that big blue uh, structure there, that's their school. And if you look beside that, you'll see a power line that looks like it runs into the water uh, and actually does run into the water. This was an inner tie that we constructed and I think we finished this project in 2006 timeframe. 
Um, but that inner tie was completed over the winter season. Um, another example of how we mobilize equipment into this community. Uh, this was a several year project for us, by the way, taking several mobilizations and demobilizations as we brought in different supplies and equipment. Uh, the construction aspect was all completed in the winter month. Um, and the only way to do this work, actually. The top photo is out in Savunga. You can see the utilidor in the foreground. Um, commonplace in lots of rural villages and you can also get a perspective for some of the low line uh, power lines and narrow roadways that we have to navigate with uh, massive loaders, heavy, bulky, long equipment and, uh, and rather large cranes. You know, I, I think at one time it would have been a good investment in STG to purchase stock in a company that makes Dunninger crane mats because we own boatloads of them and you need them to get your equipment around. Um, you can see us moving crane mats in that bottom right photo uh, and walking cranes with dunnage on the top left. Uh, but that's always a challenge uh, as moving that piece of equipment. Cranes of that size, you're typically looking at weights, a couple hundred thousand pounds uh, with counterweights could be 400,000 plus piece of equipment that you have to move from place to place. Uh, that's no simple task and it's no simple task doing that in the winter when you're going across open tundra building inner tie lines, that's that bottom left photo, which is one I really like actually. You can see one of our field guys and how, how triumphant he is with his shovel. Um, usually it takes a little bit more than a shovel to get a crane out of a snow drift, but he looks pretty confident there. Uh, the photo in the middle, actually that was in Ammonic. I have some other slides of Ammonic uh, that we'll get to, but uh, this project was kind of neat. This is a video I, I hope loads. Um, this is a project we completed in Kongigignac in 2009. I'll give it just a minute to see if it comes up. Uh, but this was a project we completed for Dennis Miners and the Chinook Wind Group. Uh, we constructed an ice runway in February of 2009 to fly in the wind components of this project. Uh, it illustrates another thing that we try to do in our projects. We like to, to see if there's ways to distribute the logistics, uh, the mobilization and demobilization costs between multiple projects. So at least for this installation, we had a crane already in Kongigignac completing work on their, uh, their landing in the community. So we were able to uh, work with that particular client on mobilization costs for that project, but since that crane was in the community already, waiting to be demobilized, we were able to put it work uh, and help save uh, uh, the IES project a little bit of money by utilizing that resource while it was in town. On the flip side there, that really challenged us. So we had the crane there, uh, and now we have wind components that we had to get onto site, and it was the middle of winter. Um, our solution there was to work with Wind and Air Cargo. Uh, we built an ice runway about two miles from the project site, and we basically had a two-month window in the middle of February where the conditions were sufficient for us to do this. Um, and I'm sorry this video is not loading for me to, to, to show it to you guys, but um, a fun one for us, we were able to fly in those materials um, over, I believe, was, was it a two-day period, Dennis? And, uh, we captured those to the project site, and a couple other photos here, too, putting up the, the turbines there. Uh, the, these turbines were supported on pile foundations. That, so as I mentioned, that crane, and I believe that pile hammer was already on site in Kogigignac, uh, completing other, other project work for different clients. These photos, uh, this is... Um, some staging efforts for a project we're, we're underway with in Ammonic for AVEC. We're constructing a four wind turbine project and a approximately 10 mile inner tie line. Um, this was a big challenge for us and it really demonstrates the abilities of our logistics managers. We received a notice to proceed on this project, I think it was August 4th um, last year, which gave us exactly one month to procure uh, about two million pounds of commodities, get them delivered to Seattle and on a boat on its way up to Lamonic. Um, in addition to that, we probably had another two million pounds of equipment we also had to get to this community and not much time to do it in. Just to put that in perspective, a Boeing 747 weighs about 900,000 pounds. So we had four of those to procure and uh, ship them all over the country, get them on one boat, get them out there in that community before everything iced up. And we made it. Uh, probably just by the skin of our teeth, but our equipment arrived before our commodities did, so we were able to uh, unload everything in October when the boat hit the landing. Uh, we got it staged in time, so it was well organized for when things began to freeze over. We started construction activities in January. Uh, we expect to be finished uh, with all of our work with the inner tie and the turbine construction in May. 
so mobilizing out here to this site, a couple examples, a couple fun facts here. I think it was uh, close to 255 uh, foot H piles. The amount of steel that we needed for this project actually required us to work with three different suppliers. Um, another example here of the importance of having good relationships with numerous different suppliers. Uh, we couldn't find one manufacturer that could provide us with enough steel for this project in this time frame. So we had suppliers as far away as from Georgia making us H pile to get on this boat in time uh, to build this project. Another photo here, um, sorry, I'm, I'm out of time here, but my last slide, or there's one more after this, but quickly, this is crossing the Yukon River into Monic. Uh, uh, it's interesting how we did this, removed all the counterweight from this particular crane, which is cat crane behind it, but in order to make this one particular move, we had uh, weeks of effort building up the ice to make sure that we could sufficient, sufficiently support this uh, piece of equipment. Uh, making this traverse here. A couple of takeaways. Um, what we've learned through our work managing logistics, it's always important to work with established partners who know uh, rural Alaska systems, uh, how things work out in the bush, who to talk to, and to really have a great understanding of local conditions. Um, you know, also, it, we, we check the weather on a daily basis and throughout the day. There's working in Alaska, it's a guarantee that somehow, some way, you're going to experience impacts from what Mother Nature throws at you. So be prepared for that. And really understand the risk of, of trying to minimize logistics cost um, and going into projects underhanded and unprepared. Um, you know what? No one wants to spend more than they have to. Uh, we do all that we can to prevent our clients from doing that. But at the same time, we would like to make sure that we have the resources we need to do the work that's required of us. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. We'll take a break right after this, but does anybody have a few questions for Clinton? I, I, I have one. The, uh, this year, you, tried to, you built the ice road across the Yukon River. Did you, uh, did you notice any unusual temperatures out there? Or was it a challenge to do that this year? Um, that was a big challenge for us, um, just in regards to weather. Uh, this has been unusually warm weather in Amonic and, and parts of rural Alaska, so um, that's been a challenge to our schedule. Uh, yes, it took us quite a bit of time to prepare that uh, ice road, not just that particular river crossing, but throughout that intertie route. Um, so. You can never really fully plan for that. And the depth of the water? Um, I'm not sure, but I believe it would, might have been greater than 40 feet. Um, there were some smaller channels that we crossed uh, more frequently, but um, uh, that pass across the Yukon was one of the biggest that we had to complete. Uh, and Dave uh, Myers with STG in the back just said that crossing was 2,400 feet wide, and the water was over 40, 40 feet deep in that area. So. Pucker time. <laughs> and with that, um, why don't we take a, like a, one more? Okay. Claire, Carl. you said do you, your, your crews work 710s when they're in the field. What, what kind of, um, how many weeks can you stretch them out for a project and what kind of turnaround time do you give them? We, um, we're pretty flexible there. We don't really set any fixed amount of time for any of our employees. Um, we leave that up to their discretion, how much time they're comfortable spending in the field. Generally, we find once we send them out, we have a hard time getting them back. Um, so it's not unusual for a guy to be on site for two months straight. So if you're going to do that time, you know, try to minimize that to about six weeks. But, you know, a lot of these projects are only, you know, they're unique because they're only a couple months long. I mean, some projects are weeks long, and, and, and you know, sometimes, you know, these projects do, do go, you know, multiple years. Try to, try to get guys like every six weeks uh, a break, probably one or two weeks, uh, but but it's really project dependent and it is flexible, like what you said. Do you find the mental state of mind changes towards the back end? Um, and the reason the reason I ask when when we're working out in some of our sites at 50C, so 130F. Ten days comes around, 
and they're, they're already starting to change. <laughs> well, it takes a kind of a unique individual to begin with to uh, kind of manage uh, working in these environments. So we uh, actually have, uh, you know, pride ourselves on the, you know, a little bit of turnover. I mean, we've got guys with us that's worked. A lot of our crew's been with us for six to 15 years, and uh, you know, we bring on new guys. And it takes a real kind of unique individual to work in these conditions for sure. It, maybe just to add to that too, uh, we have usually on almost every job we're completing, we have local hires. Uh, and you know, for them, that's their community and they live there, so it's not too much of an issue for them to work throughout the entire job. Uh, and I think maybe one other thing to add there too is we certainly have a culture of safety at STG, so there's some safety considerations when guys have been on the job too long. Um, you know, as much as they want to be out there, sometimes it's nice to give them that break where they have a chance just to cool off and to reset and to make sure that they're as productive as possible and as safe as possible. Hi, I have a question about the foundations, and um, I'm just curious if there um, are any efforts underway uh, to document lessons learned from the, the various foundations and um, how we might be able to access that information and share it with others. Brent might be able to answer that one better for you. I, I think it's a good suggestion. We need to do it in a maybe a, a structured manner. I think one first uh, spot might be to go to uh, some of the closeout reports that we've actually filed with the Denali Commission. There's a lessons learned section in there, and then uh, we could maybe use that as a reminder and expand on uh, some of those items and, and do a report for the commission. I think that would be a good idea. There's, there's several parties in this room that have been, uh, you know, put their minds together to try to find a better way to uh, deal with foundations. I think one thing that I can say is there are often unique conditions out there and one needs to do the geotechnical work and the design work related to that particular site or you're going to find yourself in trouble and you might want to be up there scrubbing your logo off the <laughs> turbine. <laughs> but it's, it's been a challenge and I think that's a good suggestion to, uh, to do that. <laughs> 